So thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Edgar Ruiz. Um, I work with the Sparkly R package. So I've um, been doing like large-scale implementations that has to do with implementing R, as well um, um, it being able to work with SQL, and in this case, Spark. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, its implementation with a new kind of Spark, which is uh, Spark Connect. So I'll start right there. Uh, with Spark Connect, uh, it's something that started in a very, very recent version of Spark uh, 3.4. In fact, it's so recent that 3.5 literally came out yesterday. So we're talking about like that close. And with Spark Connect, it's not so much a new way of implementing, like you have like standalone or Kubernetes or Yarn. This is more about how you connect to Spark, right? So if we were talking about like a remote way of connecting to Spark as it used to be before, that was through something called Livy. And in order for us to, for us to use Livy, we needed to have a full-on implementation of a Yarn-based cluster, such as Hadoop cluster, uh, to be able to get, take advantage of that service. Um, which is not ideal in the new world that we live in, where most of our data is now in like S3 buckets, right? That all we need right now is not so much a place to land our data like Hadoop does, but more about where, how to process it, right? A way to process it easily, which is through Spark, right? So with Spark Connect is basically doing that for us, where we can actually have a Spark cluster that we can actually interact with uh, remotely, right? In our laptops, we can easily uh, go back and forth and uh, interact with it. Uh, Databricks Connect uh, version uh, 13 plus uh, is ba have a Spark Connect, it's based on that. So um, you'll be able to take advantage of it if you're uh, currently using it or think about using it. So how does it work? Well, underneath it, instead of doing like state up REST APIs like it used to be with Livy, uh, Spark Connect is using uh, gRPC. Um, which uh, actually works as that layer of communication. And at this point, I can confidently say that the best way to interact uh, with that gRPC uh, is through PySpark. So PySpark will use um, other Python libraries that uh, implement gRPC and then talk to, to uh, Spark. Uh, for the machine learning stuff, which again just came out yesterday, uh, it's going to be done through uh, Torch. And right now there's like, uh, a, I believe, one uh, machine learning model implemented in that new version. Uh, so what about R, right? How, what about Sparkly R? Well, because of the implementation that's going on with uh, PySpark, uh, we made the call to go ahead and integrate through that library. And in order to do that, we're using the Reticulate package. So if you're not familiar with it, this is the package that in R allows us to integrate with Python directly from our R session uh, so we can have two-way communication with it. Uh, so as you can see in this little diagram, uh, you can go from Reticulate to PySpark uh, into the Spark cluster. So the question is, okay, if I can do this from Reticulate, why do I need Sparkly R for? Well, as if you are a user today, uh, you, can, you know that Sparkly R does other things, right? It gives you that uh, interface for dplyr, so you can use dplyr commands to interact with Spark. You can also use dbi and also the connection panes, as well as other uh, very easy to use functions that as uh, data scientists we use to run models and things like that. Uh, the other great thing that I'm very excited about is like, once you start using it, you don't have to have Java installed in your computer anymore. This has been uh, the, the subject of a lot of heartache for a lot of us to have Java working. Well, because it's all remote and because it's using this uh, GRCP, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, to get started, it's very easy. You would use uh, the latest version of Sparkly R as well as uh, the way that we've chosen to implement it at this time, which is through an extension package called PySparkly R uh, that you will install from, um, uh, from GitHub. Uh, we'll hopefully, we'll have this in CRAM pretty soon. Uh, so you, all you have to do is upgrade your Sparkly R, install it, and then to get the Python components that you'll need, uh, PySparkly R gives you a, a convenience uh, function that will install all the Python libraries that uh, you will need to use in order to, to get it working. So if you're a Python user already and you're saying, ah, I don't need you know, the convenience um, you know, uh, function, I can do it myself, these are the packages that you'll need. Uh, there is a, a requirement for you to have Python 3.9 or above. Uh, and if you are an R user and the other way around, right? Like you, you don't really want to mess too much with Python. That's totally fine too. I've 
feel exactly the same way. So I've gone through the pain of doing all this and put in uh, all the stuff that you need in that function. If you don't have 3.9 available in your laptop, it'll warn you and it'll give you some tips on how to, how to do your upgrade if you need to. Um, you can also run uh, Spark Connect locally. Uh, so this is something that we kind of used to as we start learning um, Spark. Uh, we run uh, Spark locally, uh, and what it does is start Spark, and then uh, whenever you do a connection, and actually it stops the service when you disconnect. Uh, for Spark Connect, it's going to be a little bit different. You're going to have to start the service separate and then stop it separate from your connection. Uh, at this point, we can actually make this function a little bit better, a bit more convenient. Uh, we have it available now, and we're definitely going to be improving it to make it easier to use. And to actually not so much easier to use, but have more customizations and things that you can do with it. So now we, we come to Databricks Connect, right? So how does that uh, you know, connect to, um, to Databricks Connect? So if you're a, a customer of you were working with, uh, with Databricks before, uh, you know, you heard Databricks Connect before, right, that term. But now you also hear the term Data Connects, Databricks Connect V2. So that version 2 is what we're talking about now that uh, started with Spark 3.4 through the Spark Connect that is going to be available in DBR 13 and above. Um, Databricks Connect, as same thing as Spark Connect, now you can use uh, your laptop to be able to interact with Spark. So you don't have to be inside the environment, inside Databricks, and open our studio there and all that. You can actually do that on, on your laptop. And in order to do that today, you're able to, do, uh, to connect. You will need four things, which is the master, and that would be the URL uh, for the Databricks of your organization. Uh, the cluster ID that you want to work with, also your uh, personal token that you can also get from Databricks, and the method, which would be Databricks underscore connect uh, as opposed to Databricks dash connect or Databricks. So we try to make it as confusing as possible for you, and I apologize for that. So, um, but we have some, a lot of warnings that hopefully will get you there. All right. So the other thing that we want to do is these two uh, environment variables, Databricks host and Databricks token, are becoming very standardized right now across different applications as you start working with Databricks Connect V2. Um, so Sparkly R picks them up. So that way, whenever you connect to your cluster, you don't need to set them all up. You basically just provide your cluster ID and uh, your Databricks Connect method. Uh, and of course, please, 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 Use your Databricks token in an environment variable. Do not put your credentials in an open text for your code, right? Definitely best, best practices. Um, because uh, we're able to do that uh, integration directly to PySpark, we're getting a lot of nice goodies to integrate better. So this is the Unity catalog where you can see your tables, right, uh, inside the Databricks U uh, web UI. Well, now that's inside our studio. This is the first time in Sparkly R history that we are offering more than one layer. It used to be that we would stop from table into a schema. Now we go the three layers all the way to matching to what Databricks does. So we can go from a table to a schema to a catalog, and that will make it where you can be here and have the exact same um, structured navigational structure that you see inside UC. Right. So that way, it's a lot easier for you to be able to find the tables that you want to interact with, and of course, you can also preview the tables if you need to uh, by just clicking on it. You'll see the first thousand rows, so that will like, give you that visual, you know, first, uh, um, first look of the data. Um, also, accessing the catalog data is very easy now. Uh, dbplyr has a, a new function called inCatalog, so you may be aware of uh, inSchema, this inCatalog gives you from a supposed schema with those two levels, in catalog will do the three levels, right? So as you see, you have the three uh, samples to NYC taxi to trips. You basically put that in the same order inside the function call and you're good to go. Um, that creates the pointer to the table that now will, uh, whenever you just call the variable, it's just gonna bring you the top 10 rows, right? Because uh, dbplyr and sparklyr does have those guardrails that prevent you from or me, I don't say you as in general, but me from being able to, when I do this, download the entire like billion records, right? It, you can use those goodies again from the stuff that we wrap around all this other um, communication with Spark. Uh, once you have your, um, your table, excuse me, your pointer, you can um, use dplyr as we do today, uh, the same commands, right? You're able to 
uh, push all that computation to the cluster. So instead of you having to download the billions of records and then do the summarization in your laptop, you can just write your deep layer as you would. You treat trips just as if it was a table that you have locally. And what it does um, in, the, you know, in the background is that it will translate your, um, your deep layer commands into SQL. Right, so all the computation, all the aggregation is happening remotely and you're just getting back the results, which is the exact ideal way that you want to deal with these kinds of data, uh, database and uh, big data uh, backends, right? If you want to see the, the query that you're getting, you can use show query and that will uh, provide you the, the, that query. Also coming soon, I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, this is the first time we're actually uh, showing it um, as far as the work that we're doing. Inside, um, uh, the Databricks web UI, again, uh, you have where you can manage the clusters, right? Where you can uh, start and stop a cluster and uh, be able to uh, basically get the information that you need in order to connect to it. Well, in a coming soon version of POSIT Workbench, we'll be able to have that same ability inside a new pane, a Databricks pane. Uh, that pane will match to what you see today in the, in the uh, web UI where you can start and stop a cluster, and you can also expand the details of a specific cluster and see the same information that, that you would see in, uh, in the web UI, right? So that way, again, you start in our studio and you end in our studio, right? So we start with the catalog, and now uh, with, uh, with being able to um, uh, administer the clusters by starting and stopping, and this is kind of like my favorite feature, uh, because now the first time that you connect to a cluster, right? Uh, again, remember the only thing that you would need would be the cluster ID. Well, um, the very genius uh, folks that working on this solution, which is not me, by the way, this is the IDE folks, uh, have put a, a copy button right there uh, for you to get your cluster ID, which then you just paste it in your, in, your, uh, in your code and you're good to go, right? No, uh, no problem, you start and then in our studio. And once you connect for the first time, Right, then the connections pane kind of takes over from what you've been using before. Um, you'll be able to have that connection. Uh, so you end your work and you come back tomorrow. You'll have it right there. You click on it. It shows you the code that you used to connect. And then once you say, yes, I want to connect, you go right back to the Unity catalog. So I mean, this is, this is uh, really exciting for me because uh, I'm sure a lot of folks who are working today uh, with this environment uh, we'll make, see a lot of improvements when it comes to what we call quality of life as far as interacting with it. Uh, some additional information. Um, there's some limitations right now with Spark 3.4 and 3.5 when it comes to Spark Connect. Um, excuse me. Uh, so what we support, as I mentioned before, we have the Plier and DBI APIs. Uh, the vote comment will work. Uh, the connection pane, like I showed. Uh, also, the uh, uh, personal... Uh, authorization token will work. We are actually also working, another thing I'm kind of glad to, to announce, on uh, OAuth that will work directly from Workbench. Uh, and also the, uh, most of the read and write commands uh, work today. Was not supported, of course, especially in 3.4, which is what's uh, like, kind of like right now GA available, uh, is uh, ML functions. SDF functions and tidyr, and although this is kind of sort of not right because pivot longer is available now, although not all arguments. So if you want to try an existing pivot longer code that you have in uh, Spark Connect, um, it will not ignore the, the arguments. It will just tell you that it's not supported. So it's safe for you to try out. Um, also, you can access the entire API, right? So Spark VR will not have everything. Uh, all the time, but you should be able to access everything as opposed to how it was before, that you had to wait on me to go in and make the argument change because Spark from one version to the next added a new argument, now you have to wait for me to add it. You don't have to do that. Um, you can actually, because of how reticular works and how it does the integration, you can access those Python objects directly, right? So in here, I'm uh, using the create data frame uh, function from Python to add the empty cars, and then I, when I pull it up, it's not printing the table like it does before, like right? I showed you before. It, it's actually showing you that Python object that's been loaded into, Spice, into the Spark context. And then I can access functions that are part of that data frame, in this case, uh, correlations, for example, right? Obviously, this is not the way that you will be doing it day to day, but uh, you can see that there is no limitations. 
Another way that we can see that there's no limitations is like when you extend it with reticulate, you can literally call the same Python uh, libraries inside your studio um, context, uh, sessions rather. Uh, so in this case, like for something so recent, right, like as literally yesterday started, right, you can uh, go and get your, the, the ML Connect classification uh, library that then you can start accessing its, uh, its functionality. Here I'm using the same uh, em table empty cars, right, and, and I set up the uh, or I prepared for me to be able to run the machine learning um, uh, algorithm. And then I run it here and I fit it, I get my, uh, my logistic regression, and then I can use it to do the transform, which is basically the predict, and I extract the data to pandas through the to pandas function, which gives me everything, um, like, you know, the predictions here. You can see the predictions directly on the, um, as new columns inside my, um, uh, my data frame, which, by the way, it's already inside R, right? So I run all the models out there and I can get the results back. This is just an example that obviously um, we want for you to, you to use the ML logistic regression function, uh, but again, once those features are available, we're not there yet, you can access them. We're not locking you out here. Uh, so in closing, Spark Connect will enable us to be able to communicate with Spark remotely. Databricks Connect, will, it has that enable on DBR13 and above. Uh, we're using uh, PySpark to reticulate, to integrate that in uh, Spark ER. And again, we're not limiting you, you can extend it with reticulate. Uh, here are some links that I'm going to put because uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for your attention. And here's the QR if you want to get to this presentation, we will have, which will have all the links that you need. Thank you so much.